So for this video, I'm talking about highlights of the USB 795, which is compounding best practices for sterile and non-sterile. So both areas, your sterile and non-sterile, should be separated, can't be together, and any powder should be done under a powder hood. Never compound something that is commercially available or used to be available. You should also note that your traditional compounding is exempt from the drug approval process and the current good manufacturing practices. So any outsourcing facilities do have to follow the current good manufacturing practices. Uh, before we talk about your records compounding, well, excuse me, the tools used for compounding. So each pharmacy, compounding pharmacy should have a glass mortal and pestle and then also a wood or porcelain mortal and pestle. Your glass is typically used for liquids, especially those that are oily or can stain. Porcelain is pretty much used for powders or making gummies. Wood is used for crystals or just hard powders. And some notes about your spatulas. Your metal spatula shouldn't be used with compounds that have metallic ions. And your rubber spatula uh, should be used for corrosive compounds. So for records, all the staff that work in compounding should have the proper training and those that needs to be documented and kept. Anything that the pharmacy compound should have a should be should have a master formula record, and also there is the compounding log. So the master formula record and the compounding log should be kept. That's what I'm trying to say. Those are your two logs. So your master is your recipe. It includes the name of the product, the strength, the dosage form, any calculations and ingredients, the qualities, quantities, the stability, the compatibility data, any equipment needed, uh, mixing instructions, labeling information, packaging and storage requirements, description of the final product, and quality control procedures and results. So it's basically a giant recipe, and it's very detailed so anyone can repeat it. Now your compounding log has some of the similar things, but your compounding log book has all the products made at the pharmacy and it includes references to how the master formula can be found. It includes lot numbers and expiration dates of the compounds that are the person used. It includes the person who made the compound, it includes the person who did the quality control of the compound, the pharmacist that approved the preparation, the date it was made, the number was that was made, the beyond use date, a duplicate prescription label is in there with a description of the final product, the name of the final product that was given to it, and the dosage strength. So you also have to keep records of the steps and processes that must be pretty much performed in a compounding area like the cleaning, calibration, and maintenance of the tools, all this for your logs, the uh, temperature logs for your refrigerator, your freezer, and even your ambient air, records of all the chemicals, bulk drugs, drug products, and any other drug components. So for if you have some excipients that were made from a non-FDA registered facility, they should come with a uh, quality certificate of analysis, a COA, certificate of analysis, to ensure the specification and quality requirements. So if a compound is found uh, without an expiration date, the compounder should be, use a cautious date as no more than three years from the date that the compound was, was received by the pharmacy. So some definitions to know uh, probably wouldn't be tested on this. It's more of a NAPLEX thing, but you know you have commu communion, which means reduce the particle size, grinding, crushing, mailing, milling, or vibrating. Titration to mix is pretty much you know mixed thoroughly. Grinding tablets, uh, levigation, which is adding that small amount of liquid, like a surfactant, to help with the grinding process. Spatulation, the same but on an ointment slab. Uh, there's pulverization by intervention, which is used for your crystalline products that won't crush easily, where you dissolve an intervening solvent and uh, pretty much crush until that evaporates. 
to overrise your crystalline products or powders. And you also have geometric dilution, which is a small amount of the drug is added and mixed with an equal amount. And that's just step is just repeated. Some notes about your uh, this ingredients are making in general probably also won't be on the MPJE. More of a NAPLEX area, but there's glidants and lubricants like magnesium stearate. Uh, there's a surfactant which you can use to neutralize the static charge in powders to keep it from flowing away, like sodium sulfate. Absorbent powder like magnesium oxide, carbonate, or kaolin, which can keep your powders dry. There's plasticized sizers that make capsules, um, and those are like your glycerol or sorbitol capsule shells, which are made of pretty much uh, gelatin from animals or hypomolis from for vegetarians. So if someone comes in and they can't have the animal product, you'd have to potentially make them a new product that's from the vegetable instead of the gelatin. So your lozenge contains a drug in the base and then you have your sucrose or syrup for hard, your PEG for soft, and your glycerin or gelatin for your chewable lozenges. And then also probably not super relevant, but creams, you should know that they have more than 20% water, less than 50% oil. Lotions are mostly water, and your ointments have less than 20% water and more than 50% oil, just to help separate that. And last thing about this area, and I'll move on, but your surfactants are used to help uh, two ingredients that resist each other by reducing that surface tension. So that's your levigating agents or wetting agents, basically. Now, more about records and probably what you're going to see on the MPJE. So the quality assurance plan, this ensures like the proper standards for um, a compounding situation are met. So it includes the standard operating procedures, any periodic testing of the finished compounds and preparations, uh, any records, it includes the name of the staff that are involved with the compounding, including uh, their orientation and training records. So you should note that products should be stored, should not be stored on the floor. Any products that are going to be used for compounding, pretty much, you're not going to store them on the floor. Put them on shelves and make sure that that stock is rotated so that the oldest is first. And for your beyond use dates, which I imagine probably the most you'll see are questions related to compounding. So any water formulation or non water formulations, like that maybe they have petroleum. So the earliest expiration of the product or six months. So typically this is easy. They will tell you they made the product on blank. You know that it's not a water formulation, so it expires in six months. If it did contain water, however, and it was an oral drug, it would expire in 14 days if it's refrigerated. And for water containing topicals, you have 30 days room temperature. And then of course, unless something in the product expired earlier than that for any of these, really. So rule of thumb, you know, go with the earliest product expiration. If not, if there's no water formulations, six months. If there's water in it, 30 days for topicals. Anything that's oral in the mouth is going to be 14 days and has to be in the refrigerator. Topicals can be room temperature. And your labeling for these products, they must include the beyond use date, any storage and handling information, for, because you know you might want to tell them to put it in the refrigerator to get that 14 days. Um, any information, suspend, so suspicions, suspensions of course should have the shake well before using, topical should have the external use only, any ADRs, this could be an easy question, but any ADRs report to the pharmacy, the pharmacist should report them in the compounding record, the logbook, and in the patient profile. All right, and I think that's it for 795, I'll do another video for your other USBs. Also something of note is your Drug Quality and Security Act, which was the 2012 from the fungal meningitis outbreak. So it separated your compounding. So a 503A is your typical compounding area. A 503B is your outsourcing. Uh, going through some of the documents for this, 
to note is that 503B, of course, is outsourcing facilities. They can be inspected by the FDA according to a risk-based schedule and must meet certain other conditions, such as reporting adverse events and providing FDA with certain information about the products they compound. So outsourcing sourcing facilities can actually break that 5% rule that you might have heard in some of my other videos, but we'll talk more about that in the federal videos, not related to compounding, really. But also that is a compounding question you may see.